Hello and welcome to The Rest is History. And today, Tom, uh, we are going to be talking about a country that I've actually seen play at the World Cup, uh, which is Tunisia, a country with a... Have you? I have in 19... I know you don't want to talk about football too much, but I saw them play against Colombia in 1998 in the French World Cup. How do they do? Uh, Colombia won 1-0. So... Oh, well, that's a shame. Tunisia generally... Well, I mean, generally better known... Uh, it, it, it's not as well known for football as it was for Barbary Pirates. Child so, Sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, well, come to child sacrifice. It was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And before that, it was um, the centre of the great city of Carthage, Rome's deadly rival. Yeah. And which, according to legend, was founded by a woman called Dido. And so I thought that today's episode, um, in honour of Tunisia, we would go right back to the beginnings and look at Dido, who is the founder of Carthage. And she's a legendary figure. Um, but her best known incarnation is as the great tragic heroine of the Roman poet Virgil's epic, the Aeneid. Right. And um, the Aeneid, it, it's it's a, an epic that tells the story of the founding of Rome, how Rome comes to be founded by a band of exiles from Troy. And these Trojans are led by Aeneas, who is the son of Venus. He has escaped from Troy. Uh, he's come with a, a, a fleet of ships. And the, the epic opens with them being shipwrecked off the coast of what is now Tunisia. Yeah. Um, and they they go wandering off, trying to find uh, someone to help them. And they discover this great city being built. It's in the process of being constructed. And uh, Virgil gives this great phrase. It's a kind of one of the great Latin tags, dux femina facti. A woman was the leader of the enterprise. And this woman Ooh. is the queen Dido, who has come from the Phoenician city of Tyre. So Ty Phoenicia is now Lebanon. And the leader of this expedition is Dido, who is a queen from the Phoenician city of Tyre. Uh, Phoenicia is current day Lebanon. She's uh, gone into exile um, and she's arrived at this, uh, this, this promontory sticking out into the sea in North Africa. Uh, and she has been given land to construct the city. Yeah. And she's very keen on Aeneas. <laughs> um, she uh, plays host to him. Uh, Aeneas tells her the story of the Trojan War, the Trojan horse, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's where that, that tradition comes from. And they fall in love. And oh, they go off story. hunting. It's they a go off, story, well, it Tom. is a lovely story, but it doesn't end well because um, they go off hunting. There's a, a thunderstorm. They end up in a cave and whoosh. Uh, it, it's all kinds of shenanigans are happening there. Right. Now, Juno, the queen of the gods, is very happy about this because yeah. she wants to frustrate the destiny of Aeneas to found this city that in turn will lead to the founding of Rome. And Venus, who is Aeneas's mother, is very keen because she wants to see her boy settle down with a nice girl. So yes. she's very keen. But Jupiter, the king of the gods, very cross because it is Aeneas's destiny to go off and, you know, do all the founding that will culminate in the founding of Rome. Yeah. So if he's hanging out in a cave with Dido... It's yeah. not going to happen. Getting up to no So he's frustrating. Test. Yeah, exactly. So he sends down Mercury um, and Mercury says, what are you up to, to Aeneas? Uh, and he comes up with another cracking Latin tag, varium et mutabile semper femina, fickle and ever changing is woman, Ooh. which is absolute classic of mansplaining, of course. Because, but Mercury would be in deep trouble now. Yeah, he would. <laughs> because actually, what, um, what, uh, the, the person who's being fickle is Aeneas, because he's, he's dumping on his own destiny, and he's leading, uh, lead, leading poor Dido astray. So Aeneas bunks off and sails away, and Dido is so upset about this that she piles all the, the finery for her wedding that she's been gathering together into yep. a great big pile. She stands on top of it, and then she incinerates herself. And she offers herself as a kind of sacrifice to the gods. Um, and as she dies, she swears eternal enmity to the descendants of Aeneas and prophesies that a great scourge will come who will, who will be the great kind of the bane of the Roman people. And that scourge, of course, is Hannibal, the Carthaginian, oh, yes. who will yeah. lead the elephants over the Alps and, and is going to be Rome's greatest enemy. Yeah. Um, and so, so poor Dido dies on the funeral pyre. And in due course, Aeneas goes down into the underworld to consult with his father to, to get kind of various guidance on how to set about fulfilling his destiny. And down there, he meets Dido and Dido refuses to talk to him. So this is the kind of, this is the, the great Roman epic. And they're since Virgil wrote it, there probably hasn't been a day when people haven't been reading it. Uh, it is absolutely the foundational text of yeah. European literature. 
Um, and so Dido, as this great tragic heroine, kind of stands at the wellspring of European literature, as well as, uh, you know, as, as the legendary founder of Carthage. So the whole thing raises all kinds of interesting questions. I was going to say, there's an awful lot to unpack here, Tom. So let there me just a lot to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, about the Aeneid. So it's written by Virgil, and it is written in what it's the reign is Augustus Emperor. It's under Augustus, yeah. yeah. So Carthage has been long defeated and long destroyed. It has. And yes. so it, Carthage gets destroyed, burnt to the ground in 146 BC. Uh, Virgil isn't writing it as history, as anything like history. It is a, it no. is a, it's a, it's a celebration of Augustus and his regime and Rome's destiny and I guess Roman imperialism, you could say. And Dido, am I right in thinking? So the big enemy for the Romans was Cleopatra. That was who Augustus yeah. had beaten to become top dog. So is yeah. Dido, is there a bit of Cleopatra in Dido, do you think? I think there absolutely is. Um, and I think that to appreciate the full radicalism of what Virgil is doing and the, um, the Cleopatran spin that he is giving to the legend of Dido, the best thing probably is, is to look at the alternative sources because right. there are other traditions. There are other traditions. So there's this guy called Macrobius who's writing a, a few centuries after Virgil has written the Aeneid. Yeah. And he says that this tale of Dido, that she, she, she died for, for the passion of Aeneas, is universally acknowledged to be false. So he's saying that Virgil has actually spun this story and, and presented Dido in, a, in a, an unflattering light. Yeah. And he says it's universally acknowledged. So that suggests that there is, there is quite another strain of tradition that is running in parallel to what Virgil has written. And if you, if you look at that, there are a kind of number of, of, of fragments, of sources, of kind of echoes of, of traditions that, that precede Virgil. So Cato the Elder, who is this very stern, strict Roman figure yeah. who inspires the Romans to attack Carthage when it's been defeated after Hannibal and, and end up immolating it, destroying it completely. Um, he, there's a fragment fr from a speech that he gives where he says that city, so that is Carthage, was founded by a woman, a Phoenician in origin, so that's all right, called Elissa. Mm. So Elissa is an alternative name for Dido. Right. And we might come to, to why and how that name originated in, in a few minutes. And then we have a Roman writer living in the third century BC with the splendid name of Trogus. Trogus. Um, Trogus. And uh, basically we have him through a Christian writer who's writing in the third century AD. And he gives the story that Elissa stroke Dido is, is the daughter of uh, the king of Tyre. Uh, she has a brother called Pygmalion, and Pygmalion is still a boy, and the, the king of Tyre dies. So P Pygmalion becomes king, um, and his uncle becomes th the regent. And yeah. um, Alyssa falls in love with this uncle. He's a man called Acerbus, uh, and he's a, a, also a, a priest of Heracles. And he rules while, uh, while Pygmalion is, is a young boy. Pygmalion comes of age, and Acerbus is, is very, very rich. And Pygmalion wants to grab all his gold. And so he has him murdered. And Dido is incredibly upset at this. Yep. Uh, and so she gives orders that all Acerbus's gold should be put into sacks and thrown into the sea as an offering to his shade. And then she sails off. Uh, and of course, Pygmalion is furious because he thinks he's lost all the gold and silver. No, he's right. But he he has. hasn't. Oh, no, oh. he hasn't. Oh, well, he, he, he has. He has. But it, but um, it hasn't been thrown into the sea because actually those sacks were full of sand. Oh, so what a twist. it's Dido. It's Alyssa who's taken them. So she then sails off. Um, she gets to Cyprus. And there, very, very groovily, she rescues 80 temple prostitutes. Okay. As you do. Nice. That's good. And so she takes them because she's only got men. She's only brought men from Tyre. So these 80 temple prostitutes will, will enable the Carthaginian race Be to- Be pressed uh, into service. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and she wanders off and she wanders and wanders and wanders across the Mediterranean. She comes to, um, to Africa. And in Africa, they call her Dido, which in the local language means wanderer. So this is how Alyssa comes to get the name of, of Dido. She lands in- in, in what will become Tunisia. And yep. there she meets the king of the Berbers, a man called Iarbus. And Iarbus says to, uh, to Dido, um, you can have as much land but as will be contained within an ox hide. And so what Dido does is to cut the ox hide up into very, very, very thin strips. And then she places it round a hill, which comes to be called Birsa. And in Greek, Bursa is an ox hide. Yeah. And so this is an illustration of the, the, the cunning, the subtlety, the cleverness that will be a leitmotif of the Carthaginians to come. 
Well, I like that story. I think, but I think I may have heard that ox hide story about other people in other places. That's the sort of formula, isn't it? I, I think this is the classic one. Okay, this, this is, is the, this is the kind the of the definitive, foundational, yeah, the, the canonical the definitive story, the canonical story. And in this version, so the, in the story told by Trogus and um, in one told by Timaeus, who is a, a Greek historian from Sicily, writing in the um, basically the age of Alexander, it's Iarbus who fancies Dido, and Dido is. A very chaste woman. Just to remind people, he's the he's the Berber king. He's the local he's the Berber king. king. Yeah. Yes. So he starts he starts going after Dido, and Dido piles. You know, she raises this great pile and immolates herself. But she's doing it to keep the king of the Berbers at bay. So it's and, and this is obviously what Macrobius, who's complaining that Virgil has distorted the story, is complaining right. about that actually, you know, in Virgil's story, she's dying out of love for this stranger. But in, in, in the traditional accounts, she's dying because she's being true to the memory of her murdered husband. So she's right. a kind of model yeah. of wifely chastity. And, and there's, there's a, actually there's a poem written by, by a Greek a few centuries, again, after, after the Aeneid, after Virgil's written it. And it has these, like, I never laid eyes on Aeneas, Dido says. I did not come to Libya at the time Troy was sacked. Muses, why did you equip dread Virgil with weapons against me? So that's her ghost complaining right. that her memory has has been traduced. Now, the other question, of course, that hangs over all this is how accurate is it? Is yeah, there so, any... Well, that's the key know. question, isn't it? Yeah. This isn't is one of these it, things that we do on The Rest is History that turns out to be utter bunkum, is it? Uh, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But Because what is intriguing about this story is that there are elements within it that are, are clearly Carthaginian. Okay. They are clearly, or, or perhaps Phoenician. And it's likely that they are drawing on Phoenician or Carthaginian records that, that were kind of translated in the age of Alexander by, by a Greek writer, perhaps by a man called Menander of Ephesus. So just to leap in for a second, mm. when do we think Carthage was founded, roughly? That's a hugely uh, open question because, right. because Virgil is required to have it founded at the same time as the sack of Troy. But the traditional dates are that it's a little bit later. So it's either kind of the 12th century... If you're, if you're Virgil, yeah. BC, or others say the the tenth, the ninth, the eighth century, it's old. I mean, it's but old. It's immensely it's an old. old it's still immensely old. And and do we think, Tom? Just a, one more question. So we're on the coast of North Africa, the promontory mm. basically that's now Tunis. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been to Tunis. You can see the remains of what they say is Carthage. So do we think? Do, is it generally felt that it was genuinely was founded by people from? What's yes, now definitely. Lebanon from the Phoenicians. Yes. So, yeah. so that's absolutely that is absolutely yes. It is it is a, a Phoenician city. Carthage is the greatest of the many colonies that the Phoenicians found across the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yes, so that is absolutely true, and the, it, it is a colony founded by people from Tyre. So that is true. Right. So, and what's what 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 is even more suggestive is that the names that the Greeks give these characters, Pygmalion, Elissa, Akerbas, uh, we know what the um, what the Phoenician originals would be so it would be probably Pumiaton is is uh, Pygmalion Elishat yeah. is Elissa uh, Zakabal is Akerbas so yeah. these are clearly Greek versions of of original Phoenician names but you mentioned right at the beginning that one of the things for which the Tunisians are famous or were famous is um burning children in what were called tofets so yes. this this was something that appalled the Greeks and the Romans. This practice that the the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians more generally had, and it is generally accepted now because the archaeology seems to back up the tradition, that in times of immense stress the Carthaginians would sacrifice their own children, and to the Greeks and the Romans this seemed evidence of their kind of monstrous cruelty. But you can frame it in a different way and say that it is actually they're showing how much they love their children because they're offering to the gods. Their most precious, their most treasured possessions. Right. Um, and it, it's this that gives the whole story of Dido immolating herself. It, again, it suggests that it's coming from a, a Carthaginian tradition. So Trogus, in his account, says that the pyre is on the edge of, of Carthage. And archaeology has shown that, that the Tophet, the place where these immolations happened, was indeed on the, the, the southern edge of the town. And Although the tradition uh, implies that it's children, it's not only children. So right at the end of Carthage in 146, when the Romans storm, you know, they capture the city, they're going to absolutely destroy it, level it to the ground, leave it as a cursed site. The, uh, the wife of the defeated Carthaginian commander, Hasdrubal, she is in a, a temple 
And as the flames lick at the tower, she hurls herself into the flames, uh, herself and all her children. So she's consciously immolating herself yeah. in a way to try and win the favor of the gods. And is she doing that, do you think, because she's conscious of the myth of Rido and she wants to kind of... That's a model for her, or do you think that's that may well right? be it? That may well be it, or it may well be that she is part of a continuum that reaches back to Dido. That the, the story of Dido has kind of originated to uh, explain why this is a tradition um, among the Carthaginians. We we, we don't know, but, okay. but what it does suggest is that the origins of this story that get taken up by Virgil do indeed lie in um, uh, Carthaginian tradition, and I think that there are other elements as well within the Carthaginian tradition that suggests that there may well be something to this. So it's very important to the Carthaginians that they're not assimilated into the the, the native African population. So the story of, of right. Dido killing herself rather than allowing herself to be married to uh, the king of the Berbers, that may well, you know, that may well be a kind of originating story uh, designed to justify this kind of Carthaginian hands-off approach. And isn't it interesting that they're not the only people in North Africa to have done that? Because in previous podcasts, Tom, when we talked about the Ptolemies and Cleopatra, I mean, they were Macedonian yeah. Greeks who, again, didn't marry into the local population. Keeping their bloodline pure was very important to them. And here yeah. we've got an older dynasty, I suppose, yeah. and more than a dynasty, uh, a settlement where they don't intermarry with the local Berber tribes yeah. at all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, and and so the relationship of Alexandria to Egypt and yeah. the relationship of Carthage to the African hinterland is very similar. These remain naval powers looking out to the sea rather than inland and determined to preserve a sense of their identity. And perhaps the only clue we have, uh, material clue we have to Dido's identity or the sense that the Carthaginians had of her as their foundress is that um, uh, there were there were coins minted by the Carthaginians that have been found in Italy. Uh, in the fourth century BC, and they show uh, a woman, very stylish yeah. looking woman, wearing a, a kind of Phrygian, so a kind of Asian tiara, no name, but um, it was the custom uh, for for Greek cities to put the image of their founder. Uh, and so it may well have been oh, the right, same so, for the Carthaginians. So it may be that the, that the, that the head of this woman is meant to, to represent to Alyssa. Dying. Well, I, so, so, so you put all this together and I, I think you can see that there is a, there's a really fascinating swirl there in which the figure of Dido could be cast by the Romans as a representative of, of Carthage and therefore very much a kind of villainous figure. Uh, yeah. Savage, cruel, uh, treacherous. This is the image that the Romans have of the Carthaginians. But what's fascinating about what Virgil is doing is actually, despite what Macrobius is saying, that you know, you've introduced the name of Dido, actually what he's doing is is casting Dido and the Carthaginians as as rather Roman, really. The the city that they're founding is is very like Rome. So Tom, let's um let's just take a break here. Because uh in, in good Roman style, we're all about the commerce. So um <laughs> <laughs> That's more Carthaginian, I think. Is it more yeah, I suppose Phoenician yeah. entrepreneurs. Trading and, city. Yeah. Right. Well let's let's allow a bit of trading to take place and then reconvene. You keep that thread in mind. We'll reconvene yeah. post-trading and you can tell us about what appears to be the transformation of Dido um, in the Roman imagination. So we'll see you in a minute for more Tunisian-based podcasting. Welcome back to The Rest is History. We are talking today about Tunisia, um, one of the North African competitors in uh, the World Cup. And Tom has chosen to focus on the story of Dido, the legendary queen of Carthage, probably, I mean, one of the two or three single most well-known, uh, most sort of culturally important people to come out of Tunisia, I would, I would say, wouldn't you, Tom? I mean, obviously, Tunisia itself is a later creation, but to come out of that, that part of the world. Yeah. So Carthage is the great rival to Rome for the control yes. of the Western Mediterranean. And it's the defeat of Carthage that enables Rome basically to rule as the mistress of the whole, not just the Western Mediterranean, but the whole Mediterranean. So it's, it's the conflict with Carthage is the great foundational story for Rome. And yeah. so that's why Virgil chooses to center it, I think. And, and you were just saying before the break, before I rudely interrupted you to do some Phoenician mm. style trading, that um, <laughs> you were saying that uh, Virgil had, had, had changed Dido's image. So she'd gone from, she'd become almost a sort of, you know, this idea of the sort of founding of the city and, and, and a Rome style myth. So, so what's going on there? Because she's not a villain yeah, in the Aeneid and you think she would be. Well, it's, it, it's, it's very, very interesting. So yeah, so, so Aeneas turns up and Dido is very welcoming and she provides tremendous hospitality 
And Virgil gives a description of the, the, the building of Carthage that makes it sound very much like a kind of, uh, you know, an exemplary Roman city. And I think that, that what then changes is that Aeneas is told to go off and he sails away. And yeah. it's then that Dido's character starts to darken. So she, she's so upset that she, she, she kind of contemplates cutting up Aeneas into little pieces and scattering his, 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 the body parts into the sea, rather like Medea does with, uh, with her brother in the, the Legend of the Golden Fleece. And she thinks about burning the Trojans in their ships, um, all this kind of stuff. And that, but then, of course, what she, she doesn't do any of this. And, and instead, what she does is she, she immolates herself and she calls vengeance down on the, the descendants of Aeneas um, as, as she dies. Yeah. And so I think that what, what Virgil is doing is saying that although Aeneas is being obedient to his destiny, he, he has to do what he has to do. Nevertheless, it, it, it does come with costs. And one of those costs is the creation of the kind of malevolent, dark, city that Carthage becomes, that in a sense, Aeneas's sense of piety, you know, he's, he's pious Aeneas. He's, it, it's not exactly pious. He's kind of dutiful. He's respectful of, of the charge laid on him by the gods. Right. He, he has to stick to that. But it's that, that that makes Carthage what it is as well and, and sets in train this kind of great cycle of wars that will, in the long run, enable Rome to emerge as the mistress of the world, but it comes at cost. And that, I think, is the mirror that is also being held up to Antony and Cleopatra, because there are obvious parallels there. So Antony is, is a great Roman hero, but he has been seduced, according to the Virgilian perspective, the Augustan perspective, by the wiles and the seductions of Cleopatra. And so, and so that is a, a, an obvious kind of echo. But I, I think that the Aeneid is, is a great poem, it's a powerful poem. It's a moving poem. It's a complex poem because Virgil is not just writing Augustan propaganda and he's not even writing just Roman propaganda. He's acknowledging the costs of empire. He's acknowledging the costs of duty and responsibility. Right. And it's that that makes the story of Dido, I think, properly tragic. Because it gives it an ambiguity, I suppose. Yeah. And it's, it, it becomes the tragedy of Carthage as well as of, of Dido. But, um, but Dominic, I'm very glad that you, um, <laughs> That you asked about the parallel between Dido and this is always um, this is always and Cleopatra. ominous when you say you're glad about that I've asked something. Yes, because it provides me with scope for some for, for some self promotion. So you, I, I may have mentioned that I wrote a, an opera about <laughs> yes. Cleopatra, yeah, in which all the um, all the arias. So it's a kind of the Mamma Mia of of opera. Um, all the arias come from nineteenth century. Um, come from the nineteenth century, but we when Dido dies, there's the famous lament, Purcell's opera. Dido yeah. and Aeneas. Yeah, we're in 1689. Very, very famous. And I just very, very slightly tweaked it because it, that's written in English, unlike all the other arias we use. I very, very slightly tweaked it to make it um, a appropriate for Cleopatra to sing rather than Dido. I did it with two friends, uh, James Morgan and Juliet Pochin. And Juliet was a, a singer herself. And she's very kindly yeah. sung the aria. Oh, so you're not, you're not going to sing. That is disappointing. I'm not going to because because Ju Juliet is the is the great singer. So Juliet is uh, has very kindly agreed to sing Cleopatra's lament. Re it's it's Dido's lament reworked by me, um, and so Juliet, take it away. Thank you. 
拜拜，拜拜。